I just had my uh, shot of uh, latte, so let's see how, if I'm ready. Um, just uh, one thing I wanted to say is, is that I want to try to make this as much of a forum as it is a presentation. So uh, as I'm talking, if a question comes up or a comment, please raise, raise your hand or just, uh, you know, we're a small group, and I think that can make it much more interesting. I know most of you people in the audience anyway. Yeah, great. Okay. So, um, so I don't even have to introduce myself so much other than being, I'm Bill Feitner, CTO of uh, Colorfront, and um, we uh, make software. I've been in the industry for a long time. I've been through a lot of changes in the industry. Um, I thought I've been, you know, there have been bleeding edge changes uh, in the past, but uh, it's nothing like what we're going through now, which I find really great. I mean, that's been my whole career. I'd be really boring if we you know, didn't have uh, the problems we have today. And I, I, I see it as a really pl big plus. So um, one of the um, things that we're seeing, I was just uh, make a few comments before I go on to the PowerPoint, is, is that we're really seeing a, a uh, great democratization of our uh, whole industry in that um, we're seeing a separation of um, a trend toward the separation of technology um, away from, uh, you know, being the dominant thing that defines our industry. In other words, uh, the bigger your computer farm, the bigger your, uh, the thicker your brick walls are, the bigger your screen, and et cetera, et cetera. We're, we're really moving to an age quite rapidly where uh, it's going back to the artistry, the uh, creative intent, and that's what's going to be, you know, that's the uh, business um, uh, value add that uh, companies and people bring to the industry. Uh, we still need behind all of that a great infrastructure, which is completely, you know, the old infrastructures are sort of disintegrating and we're trying to uh, grow new ones. It's like uh, Craig presented uh, in his last uh, thing that we do need some standardization, some infrastructure just to make it work. Um, you know, we've um, seen a, a, a great... Um, uh, melding of all the processes, you know, our traditional, and we'll get into a little bit of that, where um, uh, we, we had this simplified serial um, workflow where one thing came after another. It was simple. It had its detractors because, to, as Craig uh, elaborated on, is, is that one group may not know what the previous group did, and we're, we're reinventing the wheel as we go along. One of the big defining things, though, that's made a big difference and is fostering some of the changes is, is the money and the financing behind the projects. It's never going to get, uh, you know, it's never going to get any richer. It's just going to get thinner and thinner, and we're being asked to do more and more than we ever did before, and things are much more complicated than they ever were before. So we, we do need some standardization. We do need uh, clever software and clever uh, um, infrastructure and um, people offering this, uh, you know, this infrastructure behind the scenes to allow it to uh, work. Uh, so really efficiency is of the prime importance. If we don't uh, have efficient paths, we, we can't satisfy the complex needs that we have today, and neither can we do it for, uh, you know, meet the pricing that uh, is required today. So um, it was very interesting. I was at HPA last, everybody knows Hollywood Post Alliance, which is now Hollywood uh, Professional Alliance, okay? And, and, and that says it all right there. Last year it was Hollywood Post Alliance, and I was on a panel, and. We, we were all asked, well, what do you think about post-production? And I, I said, well, I think the term is uh, dead. And uh, this year, I think um, um, we've, we've come to that conclusion uh, by renaming it. And in that, what we used to have in these uh, serial separated processes are all rolling into this one thing, which we really haven't come up with a term for. I mean, that, maybe that will challenge everybody here. What's, what are we going to call this, this thing that we're doing? I mean, this thing that... Uh, where we're, we're working on production. I mean, the best we can come up with, we just call it this plain production that doesn't have a pre, it doesn't have a post, it's, it's continual. Um, we, um, you know, we, we uh, live in a system where um, it used to be uh, we knew when things were finished, and, you know, now uh, a, a, prox uh, a production will be in flux until the final deliverable, and uh, I think we'll find it's not even finished then, that it's still in flux. We're still changing it. We may do uh, one deliverable, and we may still be iterating the project uh, for uh, further deliverables. So it probably never never really ends until it just sort of, or it sort of gradually ends and goes away. And then we'll probably reuse that content uh, for future projects. So these are some of the things that have really changed. So um, 
you know, we, Craig brought up a great uh, point. What do we mean by cloud? And, and cloud, and, and Phil mentioned that earlier too. You know, you don't like the word cloud. And, uh, and neither do I. I mean, what does it mean? I'm, I think getting a grasp of that, um, you know, it is the concept of uh, centralization and having everybody point to something. And I think that's uh, what uh, we as a group here mean by, by the cloud, that uh, the content and processing and things is set up as such as that people can be, um, uh, don't have to be in any one location. It can be wherever they want to be. And we have a common place to point to, to the uh, image data as it's iterated and most important to the metadata, which uh, tells what we've done. So one group uh, knows what the next group's doing. The left hand knows what the right hand's doing. So um, we've really, uh, you know, come a long way. So anyway, welcome to this virtual conference. Okay. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to talk about here, which is sort of diving into some details beneath the surface of some of the more generalized concepts I just talked about, is uh, um, how do we manipulate these images? And most in this collabor virtual collaborative environment, how do we um, ensure that the the look, the intent of the image uh, survives? That's one of the biggest problems. Um, that we face. And in fact, uh, we come from a very simple world. If we look at television, I think we mentioned one of the previous uh, presentations. Well, um, we're getting stuff out of the camera that's no longer Rec. 709. Well, um, we're getting any and everything out of cameras. We're getting any and everything out as sources. They're all valid sources, but our simplistic workflow where we just thought about well, we plug it in, we get a great picture, don't have to worry about it. We're about as uh, you know, far away from that as, uh, as you could be, and uh, that's causing a lot of confusion in our industry. And there's no reason. It's, there's good reasons for that because we want to do so much more, but we do need systems um, to support that and allow us to uh, uh, bring us back that uh, the old school plug and play. You, get a, you, know, you plug things in whatever it is, and you get a good image and uh, things to start working because we don't have the, the time and the money to uh, spend trying to uh, decipher uh, everything. I mean, I've seen productions that come about where um, there'll be multiple cameras and multiple deliverables, and they're almost finished as separate projects within the whole thing, and that's very inefficient, and, uh, or just noodling through the project, and we, we can't afford to do that, and we can't afford to you know, just do uh, bailing wire approaches, seat of the pants approaches, and expect uh, to uh, deliver a product that meets uh, today's uh, complex needs. So um, anyway, that's, uh, that's some of the big things. So we'll, we'll talk about um, how we can take advantage of centralized processing storage uh, and how dispersed work groups which can be, uh, and a work group can be pre-production, can be production, can be what we, you know, classically called post-production, all happening at the same time. So these are people, creative people. How can they be connected to um, uh, get the project finished? And uh, um, from uh, Colorfront side, we provide software. We're not a service provider, but we've provide uh, clever software that sits behind people offering uh, various services. And um, we've been very keen on adjusting our software and building our software from the ground up to work in a collaborative, uh, connected uh, environment, centralized uh, environment. And that's one of the main goals, not to produce traditional post-production software. The founders of Colorfront uh, made one of the best uh, 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 well, first, uh, film-based uh, color correctors, and which uh, finally was sold to Autodesk, became Luster. But uh, the whole focus of the company is no longer on that end of it. They, it's, it's on this, uh, well, how do we set a look on a project? How do we communicate uh, globally the, the look of the project and, and ensure from beginning through the final delivery? Uh, and as I said, the delivery is never never a hard fixed point in, in time, uh, how do we ensure that the uh, creative intent survives through that whole thing? And I think that's one of the biggest breaches we see going on now. And a big time consumer where somebody has to sit down and say, ooh, that isn't really what I meant for it to look like. We're going to go back um, and redo everything and spend weeks and weeks trying to um, do it where if we'd had the right pe place, uh, pieces in place, uh, we wouldn't have to do that. So. Uh, in fact, I, I know um, a post company that I've worked with in 
New York where um, they had the ability to do that, where the whole project and uh, film was pretty much finished uh, up front, and they had done an iterative process. Luckily, they were shooting on a local um, set, and they were connected with uh, their home base uh, via dark fiber. And uh, when they got ready to what was traditionally going to be the DI or the finish, uh, they were doing distribution. They, they looked at it for about uh, a couple of hours, maybe did a touch-up here and there, and the project was done. It had already been, uh, you know, the look had been finished uh, as they were shooting that they had uh, they were iterating that and had it finished and it was very very efficient and uh, production was surprised well there was no uh, finished budget and and that's really where we're where we're headed so um, so um, that's that's some of the the tools that we're working on to provide you know we always hear the word whatever whenever wherever well that's that's our industry and and we have to be able to respond to that that's how when we uh, work with these things, uh, we collaborate. I, I go outside, I take a picture, I can share it with uh, anybody around the world, they're gonna see a beautiful picture. And in our industry, uh, go find a camera and take a picture and try to share it with work groups around the world and have somebody have a usable picture. It just doesn't happen, and, and it should. I mean, there's not a, a technical barrier preventing that. It's really practices and having effective software to properly deal with the images to uh, allow that to happen. So, um, um, quick thing, you know, our traditional serial workflow, that's, you know, that's what we, well, I was just talking about, we all know that. Um, we're so far from that today. I mean, we're, we've, we're moving to, you know, where we're doing all these processes uh, at the same time, uh, and uh, wherever and uh, whenever people need to do it, wherever they're located. And, um, that's the reality of production. That's efficient. I mean, when this is properly done, it's so much more efficient than our old traditional serial uh, thing. We can iterate. We can uh, iterate while we're shooting. Uh, we sort of, you know, we can shoot something, uh, work group somewhere else can iterate on the look, it can come back out. It might influence how uh, a DP exposes and lights his shot, depending on what we do there. So it's this whole collaboration. And we don't have that, that just beginning at the time of shooting. We may be doing test shooting and things uh, up front, what used to be typically called uh, hair and makeup test and, uh, uh, and scouting, you know, doing the scene shot, location scouting and stuff and taking pictures. So um, some of the challenges we're facing, as I just said, is that uh, as we move forward, there's uh, several, you know, some big trends that are happening. One of the trends is called oversampling, and oversampling a number of aspects, and uh, we'll go over a few of those. One of the ways we're starting uh, um, the big trends is temporal. We're exploring oversampling uh, temporarily and then making deliveries at multiple temporal rates. Um, uh, and, and this is a, a big thing. I mean, if we can capture more um, motion data, we have more to work with. So uh, as we move ahead with cameras uh, getting faster, storage getting um, more efficient, uh, less costly, uh, shooting projects at 120 frames per second um, is a reality. And, and it's, it's actually uh, going on right now. And then, uh, for example, there's uh, one project that's shooting 120 frames. Uh, they plan to have a couple of deliveries. One of the deliveries is going to be a delivery frame rate based on 60 frames per second. Within that 60 frame per second delivery, there will be sequences that will update on the screen at 24 frames because of the look. Some will update at other frame rates. So these are the realities on the temporal side. It's just one more creative tool to be exploited, and because we can and, and we will. So oversampling on the capture side temporally is, is something that's happening. So we think about, well, the data pipes are going to get bigger and fatter and we'll no longer have problems. Well, I think we'll keep up creatively with <laughs> wanting bigger and bigger pipes and, and moving, keeping ahead of the game. There's always going to be some challenges there. Uh, one of the other ways we're talking about oversampling is in, in terms of color, uh, both on capture and delivery. Um, you know, I think we've all heard, you know, the latest craze, Rec 2020, and let's see these Rec 2020 colors. Well, let's also capture these colors. So that just means more data. It means we have to be um, much more aware of how we handle things. You can't just plug something in and turn a knob on a color corrector anymore and pr uh, produce uh, uh, usable results. It used to be we could sort of wing it one way or the other, but uh, that's no longer possible when we do these things. We really have to have systems behind all of this to manage it. So it will be, we'll have multiple Sources coming in with all different color spaces we, that are oversampled, including, um, uh, you know, 
a lot of the new cameras. And then we have uh, deliveries, which are growing. Even for the cinema, we've been testing uh, uh, laser projectors, which uh, will go out to, uh, you know, trying to achieve that mythical, um, magical REC 2020 primaries. And I can go on a whole long discussion about that, but there isn't time here. Um, and so we'll see that. Uh, another big thing that... Uh, is coming in that's expanding it in terms of oversampling is uh, um, oops I clicked it. this dynamic range and dynamic range is capturing more of the image so there's high dynamic range on the capture side and then uh, on the display side and uh, if we look at uh, CES this year uh, every manufacturer of any of any worth was uh, showing uh, a thousand nit displays. Typically, we're mastering in post-production for a dim-lit environment for 100 nits. That's our standard uh, master. So we have displays now that can exploit much more dynamic range. We have to have systems behind it to solve it. Dolby has proposed uh, a system with the Dolby Vision. Uh, the BBC has a system. A number of manufacturers have a system. Uh, what was evident at CES is, is that... Uh, a lot of the uh, OTT providers like Netflix and some of the others are just going to offer something, uh, a special handshake with uh, certain set manufacturers. So we get back to that discussion of, well, what about standards? It's, it's going to be, there's going to be a, a lot of things. And that just gets back to our whole approach in these projects is, is that we have to be very flexible. We have to protect all the data. We have to be able to handle the wider dynamic range. And then we're going to have to, on a moment's notice, be able to output to whatever standard uh, someone may need. And uh, that's where, you know, the project may not, may be finished this year, come back next year, somebody will want a new delivery to meet a, a new kind of a display. So it's very critical that we manage all of this. Um, the other thing is uh, spatial resolution. Um, we're Cameras are getting higher and higher resolution, getting more resolution. We already just introduced their 65 millimeter uh, chip camera that's uh, roughly 6.5K, um, which is, um, you know, designed to exceed what we were used to shooting uh, large format film in. And, uh, and then on the delivery side, um, you know, the, the home display is all, uh, has all but left behind uh, HD. HD is old school. I mean, it's, it, every, you, it's hard to buy a display that isn't uh, uh, UHD high, you know, and, and 3840. And uh, if you went to CES, uh, every manufacturer pretty much showed ultra, what they were calling ultra-wide UHD, which was around uh, 5.2, 5.3K, which gave you a 22 to 21 by 9 uh, aspect ratio. So that's being offered right now for signage and it's probably, you know, people will start producing content for it at some point. So whether we have a standard for it or not, I mean, so. And then every major manufacturer at CES was, was showing prototype uh, 8K, super high vision uh, displays that NHK has uh, been presenting. So these are, this is just around, I mean, this is here today. This is what's coming, you know. There are still people, at least as of last year, before CES, that were tracking all UHDs as a passing trend that'll go away. Well, <laughs> I don't think so. And just look at the show, what's, what's out there. So um, there's a lot of growth in these areas, and this is getting larger and larger pictures in the home. It's, it's a whole separate topic, it's gonna be, which is a real interesting one, the dominance of the cinema over a home. You know, it's, it's there's kind of a, the writing's on the wall, I think, and we're going to see um, the cinema's going to be around, but I think we're seeing a lot of uh, improvement much faster in the home than in the cinema, and I think more people, as they do with music, um, hear music other, by other means than going to a live concert, but people still go to live concerts, so I think that's a great analogy of what our future holds there. Um, we have some real challenges in interoperability with all the different file formats that are coming out of the cameras and things. How do we deal with all of this? I mean, it's incredible. I mean, you, you, every camera may, you know, have one file format, another camera have another one. And then if we look on the delivery side, uh, you know, we're, we're growing and growing. Um, we, you know, we have some source formats. Every camera has their own special thing, um, different images. Um, we have um, an ever-growing... Um, selection of delivery formats. How do we get through all of these when we're uh, trying to do a production? Um, how do we meet all these? These are just some of the traditional ones that we're doing now. And we look at the new ones. IMF is uh, rapidly growing on the um, delivery side for quote unquote television, whatever that means. We sort of have that wall feature film and television. Uh, I'm, I think we need some better terms for that. But uh, um, a lot of the studios are, are 
demanding one flavor or another of IMF, which is a very flexible file format. It's really worth looking into to see what it does, but everyone wants their own separate version of it. So that's adding a lot of complexity. And uh, um, the DCP right now, just for the typical cinema delivery, uh, is undergoing a lot of changes. What's really uh, evident is all the hard work that everyone did defining the DCP standard that we're working with now, we, we've outgrown it uh, quite quite uh, quite a bit. So there's a lot of new standards and a lot of changes proposed. Whether it'll be officiated or people will just start doing it, people will start doing it. Let's put it that way. That We're not going to hold that back and hopefully we can come up with some standardization because that worked so well uh, in the past that really we came from a very chaotic period when digital cinema first came out to something that was a little more standardized. We could at least come up with a way to master stuff or have a goalpost to master for. MF MFX is uh, uh, yet another delivery format. Um, we have color spaces that are just any possible color space. We have, you know, some source color spaces. Every camera has their custom color space. The second one there is Sony, just showing the possibilities coming from a Sony camera. And actually, other than the first one, they're all all the same, but wildly different. So if you don't have a handshake to deal with these things, you have a total mess. If you're going to go into special effects with, you know, mixed cameras, this camera's in this uh, space, this camera's in that space, you know, I, I don't know how, how you can make something work. Um, and then also, when we're delivering, what the delivery expectations are, what's the goalpost? So it, it becomes, uh, you know, quite uh, uh, different. Uh, these are just some traditional color working spaces, just polling people what people have done. They're just, uh, there's a, you know, a lot of times shows are just designed around a particular camera, so you'll pick a color working space, but that uh, makes it very difficult. Uh, some of the delivery spaces that we have um, here. Um, I like to just sort of put this, uh, this trend toward more fidelity, um, of, you know, center it around those... Uh, those terms that I talked about before with dynamic range, color, pixel count, and frame rate, um, putting those together with mixing that together with some kind, some form of compression, because there are points where we can't just take all the raw data uncompressed and put it through. And it's a combination of those, depending what phase of the project it's going to go through, that's going to give us uh, uh, the ultimate mixture for uh, picture fidelity. And it's not the same on everything. So that's going to be, that's a virtual thing. Uh, one thing, as we get more fidelity, it's gonna it strongly impacts the storage, the bandwidth, and the interactivity and processing. And interactivity is a, a key thing. I mean, uh, everywhere I go, people want to interact now for television at, at 4K or at least 3840 for UHD. That's the new standard. That's what when we turn knobs, we want to see that up on our screen. So uh, that's you know that puts a lot of uh, demands on our systems. So. You know, this is a summary of uh, um, uh, where we had. I assume these uh, PowerPoints are available to the group. So um, so anyway, some of these details here, uh, you can uh, at least get off there. But, uh, um, you know, we need to get back to, as I was saying earlier, we just plug this stuff in and it starts working. Or we have some mythology behind it and we have software that can deal with this uh, type of thing. So that's been one of the goals I've been working on uh, with Colorfront is how do we how do we add something to it? Colorfront themselves, we've, we're immersed into uh, most projects on the front end. I mean, we're, the first thing that we did was uh, uh, come up with a daily system, and it's pretty much the only daily system um, on um, feature films that are used, and it's, it's growing very fast in television as television's you know, ha facing the same problems that feature film is. And I really think we're seeing those two disciplines really mold together into one. I, I really don't think there's going to be any separation. I think we're, we're, they're one and the same. As I was saying earlier, I think feature film, when you're shooting for feature film, people are, more people are going to be seeing it in the home than they are in the cinema. So that's something you want to think about, but not on traditional displays, on larger and larger displays. So I, I really think that that old school tradition between, uh, you know, well, this is for feature or this is for television, that, that's old school, that's going away. We're, and, and so we're sort of, the, the plus side is, is that we're all facing the same problems and we'll put the content through similar workflows um, as we move forward. So we really need software that can support that. We need software that can uh, support uh, uh, globally dispersed work groups that are working with the image. And, and that's that's my area of expertise, and that's what we've uh, we've been working on. Is well, how do we uh, empower people around the world to um, 
preserve, set a look, iterate a look on an image, and have it uh, uh, survive. So uh, just real quick, uh, uh, and you can certainly look at the PowerPoint to get some more details, but uh, uh, we provide, um, you know, on-set dailies, which is where, you know, people can do their dailies either on-set or, or near-set or uh, extended, uh, you know, where... Uh, they may be uh, vir virtual dailies done at some remote location, which is a new trend where a dailies colorist isn't just sitting out on set. That's expensive. If he can sit back in a, in a, um, a center doing dailies and uh, for multiple shows uh, because of connectivity, um, then that's much more efficient than he has. He can, a dailies colorist, for example, could uh, work on several jobs in one, uh, in one shift as opposed to just a few hours if he's out on location for that uh, specific show and then uh, sit around. So these are some of the things that uh, we are, we're supporting with our collaborative, um, quote-unquote, cloud initiatives. Um, so we have uh, um, onset dailies, express dailies, which is a smaller uh, streamline uh, no-brainer dailies package, um, which is the most popular. And um, um, we have our, what we, our new product called Onset Color, which is a look design tool where um, it doesn't matter what the camera is. It's just an intrinsic look design. You can start setting looks, and it's uh, simple enough that, uh, that uh, you know, it doesn't take uh, a pilot's license to drive it. Uh, a DP or anybody can drive it. And uh, so you can design looks. These looks are metadata, and then they can be applied to any camera, and they will work. I'll go into little details of how that, uh, how that works. But it's a tool to communicate looks and uh, design looks. Uh, there's uh, Onset Live, which uh, is a product where we can feed... Uh, the, the image directly out of the camera, so as you're shooting, you see the proper image, which could, uh, and a proper in, image is a subjective choice, and that could have been made by uh, the traditional colorist who is sitting halfway around the world, which has gotten some of the images in from the shoot through our upload routines and uh, done some work on it and sent back the metadata. This is what I want them to look at, look, uh, look like. Uh, they could be reviewed. They can be iterated back and forth. So this is all uh, part of the software. Um, there's a package called Miso Review, which is a color accurate uh, review designed to work with um, uh, as a web, you know, over the internet uh, uh, from a cloud, so that uh, people, work groups sitting around can see uh, a proper image. It has the same color processing in it. Uh, there's a, a software that's intrinsic with all of our packages called Copy Central, which is a, an upload routine for uploading images to the cloud, which can be custom tailored. Okay, and uh, and uh, on set live, I'll just go through these real quick. You can see it. Uh, the uh, look design tool can work with. Uh, still cameras, and uh, you can go out and capture, uh, since they all have a profile, you can capture a, a live image and then apply that look to any of the motion, you know, motion picture digital cameras like an Arri or a Sony and have a, a proper, proper look. Um, so that's uh, one of the, some of the platforms, the iterative or the interfaces to the customers are, um, there's a Mac Pro platform, which can actually make uh, real-time 4K DCPs on set if you want to. I mean, these, these have enough processing. There's uh, uh, Retina MacBook Pro, which is probably going to be a great uh, candidate uh, for the look design tool. Um, and, and then uh, for the heavy lifting, we have what we call our transcoder. And this is uh, which can sit in the machine room or... This uh, it supports 8K real-time debearing. This is a test, not that that's here yet, but uh, on general purpose off-the-shelf hardware, um, super micro. And uh, there's uh, our, we have the full transcoding image processing uh, package available uh, in the crowd, uh, either public or private. It's all designed to work that way. We do have it running on Amazon, and uh, it's available for people to test if they want. We have uh, instances we can set people up to test that and integrate that. So the full capabilities of all the color management is there. Uh, inherent in the whole stream is what we call the color front engine, and this is the image processing engine, which is allows the look to survive, and it's intrinsic in all the products, including uh, an upcoming set of plugins for some of the uh, special effects work so that people can plug this in uh, to other software. So we have a handshake throughout the project so that uh, whatever the creative look is, whoever said it, it, it survives through the whole process. So it's just, uh, it's uh, 
based on uh, ACs. People probably heard about that some, but this is a, uh, a practical implementation that allows uh, any number of looks from a whole library of looks to be mixed and matched uh, with the look design tool and come up with virtually any look, not just a fixed look that uh, ACs offers. So. Um, and there we are. I think I squeezed it, <laughs> squeezed it in. Do we have time for any questions or anything? Or does anyone have anything? And yeah. Hi. <laughs> I think the question it really, you know, rewinding back to what you saw uh -huh. at CES this year, you know, we're seeing a lot of displays, you know, the ultra HD, the ultra wide and everything, you know, and it's, we all know, you know, being in production, we don't even produce content at that resolution yet, you know, and I know there's all kinds of, yeah. uh, you know, simulations to get it up to that resolution and everything for the final consumer. At what point, you know, if you rewind 20 years ago again and we're in film and, you know, the creative technology curve was just kind of flat. You yeah. know, we made mm -hmm. your movie, we put visual effects in it, we did it, and, you know, it went on and released. You know, and I, I, I kind of rewind back to going to high definition. When we saw the invent of high definition into the home, it kind of changed the game for movie makers. Yep. to, mm -hmm. you know, they're starting to see makeup blends and everything else, you know, and it kind of, yep. at that point, technology was driving creativity, you know, and which was an odd thing for us to see. Um, and I think after a while when we kind of seen it, the curve change where creativity is driving technology right this point, we're not, we're behind the eight ball trying to keep up with it. What do you, do you think, do you see in, you know, what you're every day and do you see those turning again, meaning technology driving the creativity with like the new virtual realities, the headsets, the Oculus. And what, at what point do we stop trying to chase, you know, the creativity? Because they are, they're not analytical. It's all over the place. It's logarithmic. And, you know, for us, we try to program things and make things automated and simple. And with the creativity driving technology, it's really tough for us to do on a day-to-day -day level. Well, it's sort of like turning a young kid loose in the candy store, and the candy store keeps getting larger and larger. I mean, I think that's there, but in the end, um, the if people are going to go watch the content, there has to be the, it, it's because of the creative intent. And these are just tools, but they're tools that allow us to efficiently manage our creative expectations. And certainly, uh, from the creative side. With all the new tools and possibilities, uh, we can do more than we ever did. So it's really up to the artist uh, to use that. People will use them and explore it, but it's up to the artist also to make to make art that people want to see. And I've, we've seen a lot of breaches on that. We've seen this argument about, well, we got high frame rate. I hate high frame rate. Well, let's use it creatively as a tool. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, High dynamic range. We've all gone to the shows and seen presentations of high dynamic range. You know, it's great for burning out your eyeballs. But let's uh, um, and and but I think through all of that, you, you see, well, creatively, we really could do something. Go go watch a, a stage play and look what uh, a lighting director does there for the creative lighting on on stage and where you have unlimited dynamic range, virtually unlimited color palette, and uh, you know it's not blasting your eyeballs unless you need that for an effect. So we've got a lot of new tools, and every time there's new tools, people misuse them, overuse them. Um, uh, in the end, it's just more tools available for the user, and uh, I, I think that's growing quicker and quicker. I mean, if we get back, what we're finding is is that at the time of capture, I think this is one of the biggest things, is, is uh, that's where the look was fixed. It was imprinted. Um, we didn't do much in a way of special effects. Everything was just done in camera, and we've moved so far away from that. Those creative needs, for example, the DP who really controlled that, uh, that person still needs to be involved with the creative intent, or we'll see some of the uh, uh, misuses of the technology, as we have often see on the, on the screen. But um, it's, it's how do we use that? I mean, right now, you know, we still change lenses on cameras to get an effect. Well, you know, around the corner or light field camera, light field array type cameras, you know, big camera arrays where uh, the lens is put in uh, digitally after the fact. And uh, so we still need somebody with expertise on framing, focal length and everything, but it just means that we may not do it at the time of capture. We still have to coordinate what the actors and the, and, and where you point it and what's done with the lighting. So it's, it's, it's going to become richer and richer. Uh, more complicated, and we really are at a at an age that our old school just sort of noodling, seat of the pants. Oh, we'll fix it in post. We're so far away from that ever working, and we have less dollars to fudge it. We don't have fudge dollars anymore. We have to plan, we have to we have to plan it uh, plan it well up front, and uh, we can no longer throw the shoulders the soldiers on the table as you did. I mean, it just won't work. I mean, we're seeing that fail, you know, and there's still some productions that survive, but that, that's that's becoming less and less. So.
Yes. This might be a question over cocktails. It's a little specific thing here. You showed this proliferation of IMX or IMF formats oh, yes. now. Uh-huh. And I'm just asking if, have we reached the point at which that's really not adding value any longer because the idea of, of a standard is to have standards, yet they continue to proliferate? Well, I think it's, it's addressing uh, um, more complex needs. I, I think it's really great, and, and, it, and it was designed so it can be flexible because uh, I've seen a lot of failures as of late. Well, we've come up with a standard, and our needs are moving so fast that we invalidated the standards. We have to go beyond it, and people will go beyond it. We're a pragmatic industry. We're, we're going to get the show must go on. We're going to deliver content. So, so I think it's been designed with that, and, and I think a lot of this, um, it may standardize. There may be less uh, diversity in it uh, from a lot of the studios and things as we move forward, but right now there's good needs and rationale behind all those things. So, um, And when you really look at it, maybe if you look at the code and how you set it up, it's very complex. For example, we have uh, in our software, we have uh, we work with the, each of the individual studios, and here is a button for that studio, that studio that they've approved. So it takes that away from the user. And that's those are the tool sets we need. You, you as a user cannot dive in and set everything. If you want to, it's available in the software, but it's got to just be plug it in, push a button, and it works. And and that's pretty much our been our approach. We plug in any camera. We sense the metadata from the camera. We put the right color profiles on it. We uh, know what the uh, display is, and we put the right uh, profile for the display, and it just works behind the scenes. And we have to move toward that in all our aspects in our industry if we're going to survive. And I know we will. I mean, it, it seems kind of daunting right now, but uh, we're we're all clever. We're all very practical, and that's just the way it, it has to go if we're going to make content. <laughs> And yes. Where you're seeing far less powerful GPUs, at least in public clouds, um, uh, given the increase in core count for, for CPUs. Yeah. Well, um, that's a good point. I think we're seeing that in transition. I mean, really, Amazon's been the one that's pushed uh, uh, GPU uh, processing, but I think just around the corner are the other providers. And I think this will be a commodity that will continue to grow. The reason we pick GPUs is because it is a much more efficient unit for certain things in process. And we also extensively use uh, CPU for a lot of the codecs and things. So uh, it's a combination of both. So if you notice, like some of our big flagship computers uh, have a combination of many, many CPU cores as well as GPU. But for all the heavy image processing, the GPU is much more efficient than putting it into CPUs. Uh, we've, been, we've been playing with that very question that in this uh, interim stage, it might make sense to also port uh, to multiple, to a big uh, uh, CPU array for doing things, but it will take a lot to do these speeds that we're talking about. I mean, um, we were using, uh, you know, to, when I was talking about the 8K process, which was just a, a uh, uh, demonstration that doesn't have a practical use right now, other than NHK was very, very interested in that because it's, uh, you know, one little box instead of a rack of hardware, you know, off-the-shelf box, but uh, it, it had... Uh, um, two GPUs, which were doing debearing of uh, uh, Sony F65 and also Airy uh, Alexa 65 millimeter, real time uh, to 8K, and then applying color processing to it, and uh, um, and then the other two GPUs were um, uh, working the the the, the uh, quad display, the uh, quad HD display, which gave quad ultra HD display, which gave us the uh, uh, 8K. So. And like I was saying, um, the computers are so so powerful that, uh, for example, we, we actually had one production where um, one of our clients was using it with uh, just a little Mac Pro, you know, a little trash can on production. They they wanted to have a DCP generated uh, 4K to go do to to go view locally, and I think that's going to be an increasing change. And and that little onset computer uh, is powerful enough to to do that with this. It's two GPU cards, so it's it's. Uh, that's why we use that. We we could not have um, a big enough CPU array to do that. I mean, you could do it, uh, but it would be an awful large array. So, you know, it, it's sort of picking the technology that's correct for uh, the task at hand. So. 